Oh, live. We are live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our new webinar series, Navigating Omics Data Analysis Challenges in Biotech. Uh, I'm happy to be here today with our two speakers, and I'm happy to introduce you to them. One is Axel Martinelli, Head of Biology at Bigomics, and of course, our guest speaker, uh, Yuren, an experienced uh, computational biologist in the field. Uh, thank you both for being here and for taking the time to meet with us. Uh, our interview today will last 30 minutes, uh, of which the last few minutes will be dedicated to your questions. So feel free to uh, post them in the comment section or in the chat. And we will be collecting those and uh, forward them to you, Ren, and Axel at the end of the webinar. Uh, we will also have a couple of questions popping up the screen uh, during the webinar. So if you want to share your experience with us, we will be happy to hear your opinion on those. So feel free to use the chat for those for those as well. And now, without further ado, I will leave it up to our speakers today. And Axel, the stage is yours. Yeah, well, thank you, Gabriela. And uh, well, it's my pleasure to uh, be here and have the opportunity to interview you, Ren. Uh, we met before in, in Boston, so yep. it's always great to, to speak with you. And I thought we could just start maybe by telling people how you you started off your academic career. You know, what did you study and, uh, you know, how you ended up then working in the uh, pharma and biotech sector? Yeah, sure, sure. Nice to meet you, Axel. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so um, my background is a bit mixed, um, pretty evenly mixed, actually. So I started as a general biology major um, undergrad at Purdue University. Um, as you know, as people who know Purdue University, we have a very big structural biology focus. Um, so I also joined as a undergrad research associate in the structural group. Back then, I, I learned that's where I learned my Python skills and then stuff. But then uh, back then, we were strictly computational biologists. So we can't actually do experiment at all. And uh, sometimes we will identify interesting features. And then we would have to bag our um, bench bounded counterparts to do those confirmation tests for us. And sometimes they, because we, we are just computational biologists, we don't understand the biology part. So they will find our very interesting thoughts to be boring. And then I find that's pretty sucks. So then I joined a, in my, in my master years, I joined a classic um, yeast biology lab to learn all the molecular clonings and stuff. But then one of our very interesting project was basically um, deprioritized due to this genome-wide genome human, um, I think it was uh, axon sequence thing back then, uh, which identifies our targets being um, having uh, silent mutations naturally occurring in the human population without any significant uh, phenotype, which means our our protein is not significant. So I found that's really powerful because we, we work around clocks and then we didn't even notice that. And they, they just did the screening and they, they figure us out. So I, I find that's very powerful. So in my PhD study, I went to this lab to learn bioinformatics while um, studying the development of the um, human immune system. So that's when I, um, basically go back to learn uh, transcriptomics and stuff. Um, and then I basically go to a bigger pharma to do my postdoc training. And then to because of COVID, um, essentially when I was hired, they, they hired me as a hybrid. I have mentors in the lab. I have mentors in the computational biology team. But because of COVID, um, we shut down our site for pretty much a year. And then I got pushed towards the, the computational side. And then um, it's basically by the end of the COVID period, I figured out I should probably take off. And then I went down to become a full-blown uh, computational biologist in a smaller biotech where we, we push our 
pipelines from preclinical studies all the way to phase two clinical studies. So, um, and now we are merged and I am now go back to a big farmer again, waiting for my next challenge, basically. So that's that's interesting. We you were you know we were speaking a bit before, and you told me how you basically started working on protein structure from a bioinformatics point of view, and then sort of realized the power of omics data and how much information it could provide you, and then you basically switched to omics data analysis. Now, yep. you say that there was also a quite a drastic change in mentality between working for a big pharma company and then going to work for a smaller biotech company, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's quite obvious, at least from my my point of view, because uh, in big pharma, because of uh, the number of people you're working with and the, the amount of time you, you can spend, there's a lot of meetings. I, I think all people work in big pharma can agree. There's endless, almost endless alignment meeting and everyone was perfectly in line in the end. So you can spend a lot of time. And also as a bioinformatician, you have a bigger team supporting you and you have a lot of time to build stuff and test stuff. Whereas in a smaller biotech, um, you have a way smaller bioinformatician teams if not a, working alone or just with one or two um, colleagues. Um, and you are expect to work with the entire entirety of the company from the discovery team to the translational team to even the clinical team. So you are supposed to be able to translate the bioinformatics and even statistic concepts to the, you know, the the, the words that the, the bench scientists can understand and you are also expected to be able to understand what they are talking about. And that is actually a lot of work, which basically takes away the time for us to be able to test a lot of tools and even build, not even building them, like you don't have that luxury. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting, obviously. You know, I can imagine uh, you had a lot of uh, omics data that you were working with, uh, you know, particular transcriptomics data nowadays is, is uh, you know, very important and generating in large yeah, quantities. Yeah. And um, so in, in your experience while, while working for all those companies, what sort of analysis were uh, required of you when you were looking at the new transcriptomics data set? Um, I think um transcriptomics is definitely the number one most common uh, technologies you you see that for uh, from the discovery team when they're doing cell lines and and cell cultures and all the way to the in vivo and then for even clinical trials now we get patient transcriptomic data now even um i, I think for some bigger farmers now you even get that single cell level transcriptomics data. And the problem for that is, you know, they're so diverse and they're so different. When you're doing cell lines, everything aligns so perfectly. You always see very crisp, crisp result, but you know, that's becomes the, the expectations for the project team. But then once it moves on to patient or animal samples, it becomes more and more uh, diversified and you see less and less of a, uh, full change and bigger and bigger p-values. So it yes. becomes very hard for the project team to actually grasp it. So it, it's, that's where, you know, you all, at least from my standpoint, I always find it's difficult is to give people a expectation or a starting point so that mm -hmm. they can ask really the meaningful questions and uh, they can see what can we know and what, what can we learn. And, um, you know, in, in, in your experience working there, uh, I imagine you were expected to do more than just, you know, basic analysis like differential gene expression or maybe clustering. So what, what sort of uh, more sophisticated analysis types were you doing with your transcriptomics data? Um, I mean, obviously, a, a lot of it is... Um, beyond beyond just differentially regulated genes, but also pathways and uh, 
you know, cells that could be enriching in there, um, which, I mean, um, sometimes it's very hard because different database gives you a different result. Um, and then also, you know, biomarkers, predictions, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, which are, you know, are pretty tedious stuff. So you can't really be able to basically do that for each and every um, conditions you have for each and every of your data sets because you, you also have so many different projects. Um, yes. You know, yeah, th that's usually is pretty challenging. So you really want to identify the exact questions you want to ask for yeah. that project and be able to actually drill down in that direction. Given it a you know biomarker or a differential gene um, expression based or even you know um, other based um, you know prediction of cell types or um, pathway analysis and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's very interesting because it sounds to me like you have to juggle many projects uh, at the same time and. Um, so did you find that there were bottlenecks in your in your analysis no of course you know the the many data types but what 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 sort of bottlenecks did you did you encounter when working yeah i mean i i think in the smaller biotech the the number one bottleneck i always facing is to actually get people to start to understand the data and start to ask really meaningful questions that they, they are actually care about because, you know, um, it's pretty hard for for the bench scientists to have time to, to basically sit with you and begin to understand how the data looks like and, and things like that because it's in our head, I mean, I, I'm a hybrid between the biologist and the, and the programmer and the statistician, so, so I, I have this in my head, but you know, immediately being able to explain it in abstract words to people is really hard. So it'll be really, really crucial for for us to provide them with some kind of visual mm. so that they can take a look. Yeah. But it's then it becomes harder because more complicated actually. Um, because you don't know exactly what their preference is. One mm -hmm. person from the translational team are more interested in like how the, you know, the patient landscape change things versus a, a, a project team bench scientists are more interested in how the molecule is be behaving and stuff. So it's, it's very hard for me to Back then, before I admittedly used big omics, I, I had to prepare a big sl stack of slides mm -hmm. to show them things. And then, you know, pretty much all the time, half of team is not interested. <laughs> 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 yeah, that that's basically spends a lot of time, take a lot of time from me. And then after the meeting, we have to start to gather questions. And that takes a lot of times as well. And then we can actually get to the real stuff, which you know already weeks, even months have passed. Yeah, yeah. So I, obviously, you know, uh, you're already hinting here that there is a bit of a communication breakdown between biologists on one side and computational biologists on the other. Some of uh, of the problems that um, that you already touched on before and um obviously you know you had to provide all these slides and all these uh figures to to sort of cover all your bases with any possible questions so did you uh, and you mentioned i think before like you know one solution is maybe you know try to develop a sort of pipeline or platform in-house where it can sort of uh help you or or at least streamline uh, the analysis that you perform um, did you did you ever think about developing one, and why did you into, didn't you do it? Um, I mean, for when I work in the big pharma, we we actually um, the computational biology team is much bigger. We have hundreds mm. of people, so we we actually try to do that. 
-hmm. And we, we did end up having a fairly okay website. It's like one very long page looks yeah. pretty, um, I, I wouldn't use negative words, but it's more like it's really crude. You have a heat map, you, you have some boxes and you can click and stuff. Um, very gray, very, very um, basically crude. Um, and this ends up spending a lot of our time. The good part is we, we know what's going on in there, but you know, it's a lot of time spent and it looks pretty, um, yeah, pretty crude. And you have to really teach people to understand what's going on. So it's very not intuitive. When I joined the, the smaller biotech, I realized I have so many projects at different stages and I got to align with so many people, but then I have to do my own work to build my pipelines to analyze the data and I have to mm -hmm. actually analyze the data and explain it to people. So I really don't have the time. At some point we were going to hire a, either a, a basically a contractor or a contracting company. And then we realize it's so expensive. They charge you hundreds of dollars per hour to, to build things and it will take a month. And then you have to maintain it. And every time you need to update things, you need to pay them again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so eventually we're like, uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, and uh, so you were thinking about basically a third party solution. It's just that having one built specifically for you looked like very expensive, right? Yes, yes. So what did you do then? Did you I mean, I, I know in the end what, what you ended up doing, you, you ended up contacting us. But how, how did you find out about uh, about <coughs> us? You know, was it because you really needed a third party solution at some point? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, a lot of times when, when we're talking about Google and stuff, you, you're sort of uh, being scared that they know what you're searching about. <laughs> but back in those days, I was desperately trying to find a contractor or contracting company to build things at our budget. And then after doing it for a little while, I, I go onto LinkedIn and I see the advertisement from you guys. I was like, oh, that might be a different option that I can try. So I, I basically take a look at your booklet and I was like, this is probably what I'm looking for. I don't really want to spend, you know, those gazillion dollars to, to make a basically a, a, a playground for my colleagues. But also, you know, by doing that, I also have to spend time to actually work with the contractor and contracting companies and stuff. So it might be just a good time to test out this tool built by professionals because you guys are experts. I, I, I know it. And then your your tool looks really intuitive. And that's how it turns out to be. So, yeah, that makes me really happy because, you know, it saves me time and it saves also, um, our budget, believe it or not, <laughs> to have someone build the tool in a much better quality and even holding it for you is cheaper than you actually build it yourself. Uh, yes, yes, I think that that makes perfect sense. So, when when you were checking out the platform, right? What what sort of uh, did it for you? What 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 sort of made you go like, wow, yes? This is exactly what I need. Yeah, I mean, so for um, one thing I was always looking for is for a platform to be um, very intuitive and mm -hmm. looks really good because you're, you're, you're basically in, internalized. I, am, I was basically trying to internalize something for our biologist and for our senior leadership team. So they need to be able to not only use the tool, but actually understand what's going on. And they need to want to use the tool. If it's the old, very long gray screen that we created for them, I mean, I don't even want to look at it myself. <laughs> but the, the other thing which Big Omix really stands out for me is it has so many um, functions that are really serious like you can not only just do the old 
um, classic DC tool, but you can also use Lima Um, you can also do edge R and 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 even more. So you know you can look you can systematically testing all different models at the same time and it has so many databases that I sometimes you know learn from you guys because I was like this is a database that I never took note of. <laughs> <laughs> well, so well, well, that really does the thing for me and and also talking to you i i immediately realized these are people who know what they're doing and and that's what actually you know let me make this decision almost immediately i was like you know these guys knows what they're doing and they're doing it greatly it, it's a, it's a great looking tool that actually has solid scientific background Oh, thank you. And uh, actually, I'm I'm really curious now. So you say that you actually had some databases that you, you didn't know about. Can you can you just uh, give me an example? I'm, I'm... Um, I mean, I I use some pathway analysis um, databases like Hallmarks and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know those common ones. But you have a database that's have like twenty or even even more than that. So I I would have to commit. To, to to admit actually the majority of them I didn't heard of. <laughs> and and when I looked them up, they're actually very sound database. So yeah, know. you you know, unless you actually work in the field, you don't know them. And and some of them are like drug interaction database and stuff. That's our outside my field back then. So I, I learned a lot from you guys, to be honest. <laughs> well no, that's that's it's great to hear. And uh, so when 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 you eventually adopted the company, did it improve your workflow? Did it uh, did it also help you, of course, but also the biologists in the team? Yes, yes. I mean, we we ended up having four lessons. Um, I'm rotating it to the um, to our project leaders, um, so they can you know have a we we build a sign up system so that people can use it. Um, when they have projects and they want to take a look. Um, so it was pretty good in the translational leaders and uh, actually um, the, I think all the project leaders, they use it and they, they find it's really powerful. I mean, obviously there, are, there is going to be a learning curve because it's, it's such a vast uh, tool but because it's so intuitive, you, you conceptually know what you're looking at, then you can use it. There is no, you know, really calculations for on their end to be involved. So they just look at the result they're cared about. They can look at heat maps, differential gene expressions, pathways, and all that good stuff. And uh, and you guys have a very comprehensive teaching, and because you. you Back then, you guys have this business trip, so we had the luxury of having you guys on site to give us the. It the was first, our pleasure to meet yeah, you. Yeah, the, the, the first uh, training session, so it was really helpful. No, it's uh, it's great to hear, and um, I mean, it, it's great to hear as well that uh, it, it it basically improved both your life and and that of uh, of the biologists as well. Because uh, you know, as, as you as you rightly mentioned, uh, one of these important issues is the communication between the you know computational biologist on one side and the biologist on the other, and uh, to have a tool that uh, makes that easier, and at the same time is always intuitive for the biologist and uh, makes it easier for the bioinformatician to just put the data there, delegate. To the biologist, uh, you know, and uh, and then be able to have a constructing communication where you know, things are a bit more clear to both of, of the parties rather than yeah 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 I, I definitely found it's very very different when they actually have their hands on big omics and start to you know even just look at the the heat maps or searching for the their favorite genes to see where it is and stuff makes their questions in our meetings way um, way higher in quality. And there's less of those questions that they ask that I, I end up looking into and there's nothing interesting about that and we are both disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you know, like as you rightly say, uh, you know, depending on the data set you're working with, you know, you, you can have more or less noise in the data. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's frustrating, isn't it, that you start working with a data set and then uh, suddenly uh, you realize, ah, you know, I spent so much time preparing it and it's actually not looking that great. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, often when people don't actually have their ability to look at their data interactively and understand, you know, what are the magnitude of changes and the variations in their data. So if they can play with it, I mean, way more power to us. <laughs> to <play. laughs> no, it's, it's great to hear. And uh, hopefully it also means it saves you a lot of time that uh, you would have yeah. otherwise invested. Uh, chasing ghosts sometimes, that's, that's what we say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So no, it's great. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Gabriela. Yes. No worries. I, I was just jumping in because we got a question which is actually perfect for the topic you were discussing. I mean, you you were already kind of touching upon uh, this topic a bit earlier and even now. So Shanaz is asking, could you speak to the separation of roles when it comes to computational biology and asking the right biological questions? Uh, I have some experience in this from the academic side and I'd be interested in your take. Thanks. Hmm, this is a very interesting question. I mean, the right biological questions itself, um, you know, comes from where you actually, what actually you cares about. For a, um, a as I, I sort of touched a little bit on, for the project team who are actually developing the antibody and the, the, the drug, um, they are more, interested in how the cells is behaving and you know how their molecule is behaving what are some of the hypotheses that they can they can derive from it and if there's competitors you know how how as our molecule differentiate potentially can differentiating from the competitors molecule but from a translational standpoint they're more interested in you know um, is this something that uh, we can build a translational hypothesis on? Um, or is this something that we can potentially use as a biomarker? Is this, then if it's a biomarker question, it becomes like, is this something we can um, easily measure? Is that a blood cell um, number change where you can do a simple blood test? Um, or, you know, you have to do all the way to the sequencing, then it becomes really a pain on the back to actually be able to tackle. So it changes a, a lot. Um, that's also, I, I think, why having something like a big omics is really helpful because they can play with themselves and actually realize, okay, this looks interesting. I'm going to ask you to verify it. Or I was expecting this. Why didn't I see it? If there is a way we can look into it. It, or, or they found something I expected. They start to ask me if they're crazy or this is actually not the most stringent way to look for the answer. So you, you know things like that. It's it's a very broad, a very interesting question. No, it is, and uh, I think also the perspective changes a lot between academia and biotech. Right in academia, sometimes you have more time. To pursue your pet project or you know yeah, look into yeah. your pet pathway i don't think in in biotech sector you know you, you you have that luxury you really have to deliver right yeah yeah for sure we are pushing pipelines so you have to meet certain milestones at certain times if you don't then you know that's also a milestone that's like yeah we we didn't deliver <laughs> uh, yes yeah, no, and uh, you know, I imagine in there, you know, I mean, we, we all know time is of the essence, but even more so in in the biotech sector. Yes, yes, for sure. Well, I think we are also approaching our uh, time limit for today. It has been a wonderful discussion, and again, thank you so much, you, for taking the time to meet with us today for sharing your experience. It has been. Uh, very insightful and i hope it was so for our audience as well 
And I would be actually super happy to have you back at one point in time in our webinars. But uh, in the meantime, I just wish you the best of success in your work and in your uh, future research endeavors. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank you again to all of the audience for joining today. Uh, you will be able to watch this uh, webinar also on demand on recording. It will be available here on LinkedIn. And if you have any suggestions for future webinars, feel free to comment in the comment section. We'll be happy to uh, know your opinion. And if you'd like to hear more of something, uh, at Bigomics, we support biotech and pharma teams, as you also mentioned in their omics data analysis by providing highly interactive and user-friendly uh, visualization platforms uh, for transcriptomics and proteomics data. That would be our omics playground platform. So if you're interested in knowing more on how to reduce that time spent on routine tasks and free up uh, your time uh, to focus on more complex challenges, as uh, so you and did, we would be happy to walk you through the platform and functionalities or just uh, feel free to visit our website to learn to learn more about the platform. We would be happy to show you more. And yeah, thanks again to everyone and make sure to follow us here on LinkedIn to not miss any of the future webinars that we have planned. Thank oh. you, you and Axel for being here. Oh, thank you. Thank and you. again, it was really great. Uh, chatting with you again you and you know hopefully we will meet again in boston or maybe in switzerland who knows <laughs> yep yep i'm looking forward for that <laughs> likewise likewise thank you all bye 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 thank you guys bye thank you